to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies, and learn a lot about them too. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're once again looking at the original Friday the 13th, released in 1980. When I launched Dead Meat in 2017, I chose to begin the kill count with the Friday the 13th franchise. On April 7th, I released the very first episode of this show, where I looked at a low-budget slasher that would change the horror genre forever. Since then, I've made nearly 300 episodes of the kill count, and in that time, the show has evolved dramatically. It is now a much more informative and celebratory production, free of the cynicism and speed talking that were signatures of my earliest episodes. It made sense for me to start the channel with Friday the 13th, and because I did, I was lucky enough to see Dead Meat grow real big real fast. Now I want to go back and give this historic franchise its proper due. My original episodes were cursory, and while charming, somewhat shallow. It's time to give Friday the 13th the five-star kill count treatment. That's because no other franchise has shaped the horror genre quite like Friday has. When people think of horror movies, they think of Friday the 13th. Maybe not by name, but they're probably picturing a hulking killer in a hockey mask slaughtering scantily clad teenagers. There was a Friday the 13th movie released in 8 of the 10 years of the 80s, right as the horror genre was becoming better known in mainstream pop culture. The tropes of the franchise became the tropes of the genre. Its weaknesses became the criticisms of horror as a whole. To date, 12 Friday the 13th movies have been released, all of them theatrically and most of them successful at the box office. For better or worse, this franchise is the genre's standard bearer, and holding the flag high is the ghoulish goalie Jason Voorhees. Jason is so infamous he often just goes by his first name, and he's known to anyone who pays attention to pop culture, even if they've never seen a horror film before. Sure, they might have some inaccurate assumptions about him. Most commonly, he's erroneously depicted with a chainsaw instead of his trademark machete. I'm guessing that comes from some sort of mental merging with Leatherface, seeing as how Jason has only ever been attacked by a chainsaw before. He's never wielded one himself. Despite the occasional misconception, though, Jason is still probably the best-known horror movie killer. And yet, he's not the killer in the film that started his franchise. This fun fact was widely disseminated thanks to Scream, but it's still interesting to reflect on how horror's most infamous murderer didn't show up looking like himself until the third movie in the series. The original film is a bit of a whodunit and reveals its killer after 70 minutes of first-person shots that it lifted from Halloween, and which was done in Black Christmas even before that, but no one ever seems to give that movie the credit it deserves. In any case, it was Halloween that producer Sean S. Cunningham asked writer Victor Miller to imitate. And I don't mean just a little bit. Sean called me up and said, um, Halloween is making incredible money at the box office, let's rip it off. That is keeping it real. After producing Wes Craven's Last House on the Left in 1972, Cunningham found himself making unsuccessful kids' films with Miller and producer Steve Miner. He figured horror was the best way to make something profitable, and set out to do it with nothing more than a title, Friday the 13th. I didn't know what the movie was gonna be, but the, the idea of, of the title intrigued me. Motherfucker put an ad in Variety, calling it the most terrifying film ever made, even though he didn't have a script or story yet. And the damnedest thing is, that worked! A trio of shady theater owners from Boston were so impressed by the ad, they gave Cunningham half a million to make his movie. As with their Little League Kids films, Cunningham directed and produced Friday, while Miller wrote the screenplay. A legal battle of rights between these two is the reason the franchise hasn't had a new film in a dozen years, even while other series see resurrections and revivals. I can't get into the weeds of that lawsuit here, but it is why the video game stopped being updated. Damn shame, that game was great. Unlike this movie. I might get some shit for this, but as important as this movie is to the genre and me personally, I think it's pretty bad. And I'm not alone. Betsy Palmer knew what was up. He sent me the script, I read it, and I said, what a piece of shit. Oh my god, she said that sitting right next to Vic Miller. Though Palmer later came around to the film, her initial assessment was right. Friday the 13th is a plodding bore that doesn't do anything better than slashers made before or since. In fact, I think it makes the subgenre look bad. There's a litany of other slashers that are better made or more entertaining, or both. In this first Friday film, scenes drag on forever, with all the urgency of an Italian neo-realist film. That's the genre so slow that its most famous movie is 90 minutes of a dude looking for his dog. I honestly think the only reasons this movie got famous is because of its great marketing and because it did a good job 
job combining parts taken from other horror films. Cause Halloween wasn't the only one that Friday ripped off. Sean was very insistent that we borrow from Hitchcock. Regardless, a lot of people fucking love this franchise, and I can respect that. It's kind of a populist series. These movies are dependable, almost blue collar in a way. You know what you're gonna get with them every single time. Plus, there are some things, even in this first one, that are genuinely great. The name, which does kick ass, the music by Harry Manfredini, the late injection of energy, courtesy of Ms. Betsy Palmer, and of course, the thing this channel was built upon, and the one place where Friday blows Halloween away, the kills and makeup effects infamously done by Tom Savini. How many were there? Well, I've told you once before, but it's always good to go back and double check your work. Let's get to the kills. The movie begins at Camp Crystal Lake in 1958. This cold open that takes place in the past was another thing Miller took directly from Halloween. As a shaky point of view shot checks in on their checker playing young charges, the camp counselors strum guitars and sing Bible tunes by the fire. Hallelujah. Claudette and Barry both get horny for Jesus, so they clasp each other's Christ-loving hands and sneak away for some barn attic fool around. Things are getting real sexy on that potato sack when the first person intruder happens upon them. We weren't doing anything, we were just getting killed! An off-screen stab leaves a bloody wound in Barry's gut and gives us the first ever kill of the Friday the 13th franchise. Claudette, despite being a boxer, or box thrower, also meets her end when the camera comes at her face in choppy slow-mo and kills her with a freeze frame. After the screen flashes to white, we get a title card! Oh, damn it, broke the mirror. The opening credits are painfully planned just white Helvetica looking font against the black background. It's shocking they'd stick to the style as long as they did, but I guess it allows you to enjoy Harry Manfredini's score. <laughs> Although it's pretty similar to Bernard Herrmann's Psycho score, I maintain that Manfredini's music and sound design was essential to Friday the 13th's success. It's now present day, which for this movie means 1979. Annie Phillips is trying to get to Camp Crystal Lake, but everyone in town gives her dirty looks for bringing the place up. Camp Mud. They're opening that place again? Hell yeah they are, lady, which has got the town's eccentric crazy Ralph wilding out. Never come back again. Oh, shut up, Ralph. Nah, you don't need to shut up, Ralph. Say whatever you want, my bucket hat wearing friend. It's got a death curse. Yeah, death curses and shit. That's better than the type of shit Enos the truck driver be saying. All the girls up there gonna look as good as you. Aw, oh, man. And watch the hands, Enos. Come on. If Enos's voice sounds familiar, by the way, might be because actor Rex Everhart voiced freaking Maurice in Beauty and the Beast. A horrible, monstrous beast. So I guess this town's got two two crazy old men in it. Crazy old Maurice. Enos reluctantly drives Andy towards the camp, telling her all about its past troubles, which seem to stem from one tragic accident. Boy drowning in 57? Since then there have been fires and water poisoning, but Andy swears she'll be okay, so he drops her off and wishes her well. Later, Andy's picked up by an unseen driver who speeds past the camp's turnoff and brings in the Manfredini. Hey, wasn't that the road up for Camp Crystal Lake back there? With the killer unseen for most of the film, Manfredini used the music as a stand-in and signifier. When you heard it, you knew the killer was there. He was inspired by a similar use of the shark theme in Jaws. To escape that music to murder by, Annie tucks and rolls in a stunt actually performed by her actor Robbie Morgan. Annie takes off into the woods and is pursued by the vehicle driver, who eventually catches up to her and slits her throat against a tree. Those cold open kills were deceptively tame. Now we're getting the full Savini. For this effect, Savini used a mold of Robbie Morgan's neck to make a rubber prosthetic she wore over a blood tube that ran up her sleeves. Love the way the prosthetic slits open when Robbie Morgan moves her jaw. Tom Savini was 26 years old when Cunningham sought him out based on his work in Dawn of the Dead. He was one of the first people hired and was essential to bringing Friday to life. I think his contributions are right up there with Sean Cunningham, producer Steve Miner, and Vic Miller. Looks like Annie won't be able to cook for Camp Crystal Lake's reopening, which is headed by this dude who's gonna hurt his back chopping wood that way. This mustachioed man is Steve Christie, and he's hired a bunch of teens to be his counselors, some of whom arrive backed by a peculiar music choice that seems completely out of place in the series. <laughs> 
seriously, where did that bluegrass come from? And more importantly, where does it go? Steve Christie's favorite employee is Alice Hardy, played by Adrian King. She's a capable, handy woman and artist, which wins her special attention from Steve and his jorts. Yeah, I'm not a body language expert or nothing, but something tells me she's not a fan of that face caressing. Steve heads into town, leaving his merry band of counselors behind. Since there are future meatbags for the skill count, let's meet them! And don't worry, it won't take long. They're not that deep. They were meant to be down-to-earth, kids-next-door types, which is why casting directors Julie Hughes and Barry Moss hired New York stage actors, as opposed to more screen-seasoned actors from L.A. Brenda's the responsible one, making her a target of the camp goofster net, whose pranks range from the dangerous, to the deceptive, to the Dan Snyder-esque. The super-sexy horny couple is Jack and Marcy, Jack, of course, played by Kevin Bacon. By this point, Bacon had had a part in Animal House, but he had gone back to waiting tables in New York before he was cast in Friday. He'd later go on to huge fame after starring in Footloose, but unfortunately, I've never seen him in any Friday the 13th special features. What, you too good for horror, Kevin? There's also Bill, who's kind of another love interest for Alice, but he's pretty much a nothing guy. Most interesting thing about him is that he's played by Bing Crosby's son, Harry, and that it's really him playing guitar in a later scene. <laughs> That's a tasty lick, bruh! Most of Act 1 is these kids doing random shit around the camp. Friday was filmed over seven weeks in the fall of 1979 at an actual Boy Scout camp called Nobi Bosco in Blairstown, New Jersey. I actually own a piece of the doc used in this movie, since Chelsea got it for me after I started Dead Meat. Thanks, hon. Unlike in my original video, I'm not gonna show the footage of when they killed the real-life snake. I only mention it because it's a well-known oddity of the film, and because the story behind it pisses me off, so I've got a rant for a minute. It. Turns out that snake wasn't just a random one they found and killed. It was a snake performer and pet owned by a guy who didn't know they were going to kill it. Savini asked to borrow it, and they hacked it up without warning. What the fuck is that about, man? That's fucked up, Tom. The counselor's last pre-supper time experience is a pop-up pantry visit from Crazy Ralph. He prattles on about how doomed they are before piecing out the front door and speed walking away. You're doomed. You're doomed. You know what? I changed my mind. Shut up, Ralph! As the sun begins to set in an unusually beautiful shot for this film, all of Jack and Marcy's lakeside grab ass causes Ned to grow jealous and sad. He sees an unknown person walk into a cabin, and after following them inside, is never seen alive again. Guess he's gonna miss the incoming thunderstorm, which is just film lights being flashed on and off, and some strangely sincere acting from Kevin Bacon. It's gonna storm. <laughs> you can tear down that valley like a son of a gun. Excuse me, sir, what kind of movie do you think you're in right now? The storm moves over the lake in more shots that I legitimately enjoy as we begin this long night at Camp Blood, which was Victor Miller's original title for his script. Jack and Marcy take refuge inside a cabin, which is the perfect place to flash some butt crack and get to business. Yeah, it's horny o'clock here on Crystal Lake, because the other counselors are starting up a game of strip monopoly. Not joining the others for this camp-wide horny o'clock meeting? Ned, who's dead, baby. We see him with his throat slit in the top bunk above Jack and Marcy. So, you know that trope about how sex gets you killed in a horror movie? That thing was hammered home in the Friday the 13th franchise, which is why after Marcy leaves to wash up, we get a classic post-coital kill. Jack lights up a J, then feels some blood dripping from above. A nice distraction before a hand grabs him from beneath the bed. Jack is killed with an arrow that pierces through his neck from below. It's probably the film's most infamous kill, and is excellent, even if these super high-res transfers reveal these slightly off-color prosthetic attached to Kevin Bacon's head. The rest of Bacon's body was underneath the bed, along with Tom Savini and his assistant slash friend Tasso Stavrakis. Previously seen on the kill count in Day and Dawn of the Dead, films where he also helped Savini do makeup and stunts. While filming this kill, the blood tube's pump broke, so Stavrakis grabbed the hose and blew into it to save the shot. It caused the big spurt that makes Bacon visibly react and helped cement this kill as legendary. Jack's lover Marcy is the next one to go, after some quality underpants time in the mirror. She turns around and sees her attacker, who raises an axe in the air and brings it down right into her face. It might not be as infamous as the arrow through the neck, but I love it all the same. For this kill, Savini used one of his favorite tricks of the subconscious, show the audience that the murder weapon is real before doing the kill with a fake prop. So you give some power to the real weapon, so when the rubber weapon comes in, it still has that power and weight and strength and of the 
real axe. That's why we see the axe bang against the light and make a noise. It makes us feel an impact we never see, and disguises the rubber axe affixed to the actor's head with mortician's wax. Before our virginal final girl Alice can finish unbuttoning her blouse, the storm kicks in and cancels Strip Monopoly. Damn, what are you, Storm? The horny please? Brenda goes back to her own cabin, where she puts on her finest Geppetto nightgown and settles in for a good read. Nothing to distract her from this literature. Except the voice of a crying little boy. Nothing besides that. Brenda heads outside in the pouring rain and winds up at the archery range. The floodlights come on, blinding her, and she's killed off screen by some arrows. But I'm counting her now because we hear her scream, implying that the kill has occurred. Bill and Alice start finding clues that things might not be cool at Crystal Lake. There is one great shot that I think is worth pointing out here. After Alice breaks the window to the office to call the police, the camera tracks over to look at them through the window, then continues tracking over to show that the phone line has been Cut. I found that unusually artistic. With their vehicle similarly sabotaged, Alice and Bill are stranded here until Steve Christie gets back. <laughs> that fucking guy. He's been hanging out in a diner as his teenage counselors get slaughtered. He gets back to camp only to be blinded by a light, and it ain't Manfred Mann. It's someone he recognizes. Oh, hi. Doing on this mess. Oh, you know, chillin'. Killin'! Steve Christie's killed with an off-screen gut stab that cuts away faster than a flying machete. The POV killer turns off the camp's lights through the power of a fade to black. Bill leaves Alice to a couch nap as he goes to look at the generator, but when she wakes up sometime later, he still hasn't returned. Unbelievably, the movie still drags its feet this far in. We sit there and watch Alice make a pot of coffee, for God's sake. Come on, movie! This isn't suspenseful, it's boring! Can we please liven things up around here? <laughs> Thank you! Alice finds Bill's body hung on the door with a bunch of arrows, stuck there like a plaid-shirted pincushion. With Alice's scream and some Manfredini, our first Friday Final Girl circuit begins. Eh, kinda. Alice suffers from a boring false start as we sit there and watch her blockade a door with a single two-minute long shot. It could have been cool if it didn't cut away before Brenda's body flew in through the window. I already counted her earlier, but now we see that she's, uh, all roped up. And also that she looked suspiciously Savini esque when she came in through that window. Alice's race is put on hold when she sees a car pull up. It's time for this movie to get an injection of character. How are you? Well, I, I'm Mrs. Voorhees. An old friend of the Christie's. There, there, Alice. Betsy Palmer's here to finally make this movie interesting. You can already tell something's off with Mrs. V from her very first conversation, but she keeps up a facade of normality just long enough to fool Alice and give Palmer some kick-ass acting to do. Steve should never have opened this place again. There's been too much trouble here. Prior to Friday, Betsy Palmer was best known as a panelist on old game shows like I've Got a Secret. She wasn't eager to do a horror film, but her agent called her the same week her car broke down. The role paid $10,000, the same price as a Volkswagen Scirocco she wanted. I need the car. Send me the script. Palmer showed up the last 10 days of the shoot, and by all accounts was a lovely and considerate professional. Though she initially thought very little of the film, she came to appreciate that it kept her relevant late in her career. At this point, Mrs. Voorhees drops the act and reveals the motivation that would launch a dozen films. Did you know that a young boy drowned the year before those two others were killed? The counselors weren't paying any attention. They were making love while that young boy drowned. She says Jason's name for the first time ever and reveals that she's his mother who's been trying to keep the camp closed since then. Thus the fire and water poisoning that Enos mentioned earlier. Although all of that is cool in retrospect, it's an awful reveal for a movie meant to be a whodunit. The unmet mother of the unmet kid who was one time mentioned to have drowned is a pretty impossible thing for any viewer to have guessed. The only reason it works at all is because of Betsy Palmer. Mrs. Voorhees starts having herself little hallucinations where she hears her son yelling for help. She promises that she will help by killing negligent counselors like the ones that let him drown. Look what you did to him! Alrighty, yeah, let's get this circus started for real! We've got some back and forth attacks, a dead body discovery, or two, haha, <laughs> Christine! And, you know, the whole screaming and running around thing. Mrs. Voorhees does her part to make the race special, bringing out the crazy eyes and talking in a creepy little boy voice. Kill her, Mommy! Kill her! Don't let her get away, Mommy! I won't, Jason. 
I won't. Gotta say, Betsy, whatever you're paying your dentist, it's not enough. She catches up to Alice for a few rounds of catch, then a game of corner slap around, which saw Palmer actually hitting Adrian King for real. Oh, when we hit somebody on stage, we hit somebody. I hope King didn't pay her a receipt and actually uppercut her cooter with that gun butt there. The chase goes on to include a casual machete swipe and a Flynn Rider strike that makes Mrs. Voorhees bleed from her head. Good work, Alice. The long fight between Alice and Mrs. Voorhees, which continues after Alice retreats to the beach, was filmed over two nights with fight choreography done by Savini and Stavrakis. Since production couldn't afford real stunt doubles, all this action was done by Palmer and King themselves. They really beat the shit out of each other there. We all did everything ourselves. I mean, what you saw was what we did. Good thing Pam didn't land that German suplex then. Alice escapes Mrs. Voorhees and grabs her machete off the ground. In a classic kill, she charges at Mrs. Voorhees in slow motion and cuts her head clean off, leaving some hairy hands behind grasping at air. Those hands belong to the bacon blood blower Tasso Stavrakis. He had the foam Mrs. Voorhees head attached to his shoulder with toothpicks so it would come off easily when it was hit with that real machete. Alice walks away the victor and is floating in a canoe the next morning as the cops arrive, promising safety at last. It's a lengthy sequence I enjoy thanks to Manfredini's score, which opens up to be lush and melodic for the first time in the film. It does a good job getting you nice and relaxed, as does the peaceful lake water. And that's when Swampy Boy Jason appears in the so-called chair jumper ending. Another thing lifted from another horror movie as Cunningham and Miller were ripping off the jump scare ending from Carrie. This first ever depiction of Jason Voorhees was performed by Ari Lehman, a kid actor suggested by producer Steve Miner since he knew him from Manny's Orphans, one of those kid movies he made with Cunningham and Miller. Originally, Cunningham was going to have his own son Noel do it, but his wife ixnade that and play for him to be Ace and Jay. Were it not... For her, I would have been Jason. I would have been the first Jason, and I'm not bitter. And so it was Ari Lehman who had to submerge himself without a wetsuit in New Jersey November lake water. But he loved doing it, and excitedly discusses it to this day. Lively guy, fun to talk to. The movie ends with Alice waking up in the hospital, because that Jason jump scare was nothing but a dream. Alice doesn't think so, though. Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. Then he's still there. Or is he? No, wait, he definitely is. We've got 10 more movies ahead to prove it. How many people can a mother's love kill? Well, before I tell you, did you know that there was once a young kitty named Lucy who didn't get pets one day? Oh, the horror movie characters around her were too busy being killed to pet her. What's that, Lucy? What about the numbers? Count them, James, count them. I will, Lucy. I will. Ten people died in Friday the 13th, but those were make-believe kills, unlike that poor snake. The victims consisted of five men and five women, a nice even split to kick off this franchise. With a runtime of 95 minutes in the unrated version that I used, that left us with a kill on average every nine and a half minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Jack. I almost gave it to Mrs. Voorhees, but that kill was done with a fake head. The fact that we watch Kevin Bacon's face as he dies is what gives this kill the edge. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Steve Christie. I get making the first two kills low-key to catch viewers off guard later, but by the time we get to body oil Steve's death, an off-screen stab doesn't cut it. And that's it. Friday the 13th came out in 1980 and made more money than The Shining, which came out two weeks later. I think its success was largely because of its marketing, which brings up one more dude critical to this movie's legacy. Frank Mancuso Sr. was a VP at Paramount when he bought the American distribution rights for Friday the 13th. Instead of playing it only in drive-ins and grindhouse theaters, he took the unusual approach of treating this little horror movie like a major motion picture. He opened it on a thousand screens in mainstream theater chains with a huge marketing campaign targeted towards teens and 20-somethings. He believed in the movie's potential, and it paid off bigly. So much that Paramount asked for another one as soon as the box office reports came in. Part 2 would be released less than a year later, and I'll look at that on Friday. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Remember the 90s? Thank you for shopping at B. Dalton's. When shopping malls were cool. When the internet was a whittle baby. When you felt safe. Ah! Well, maybe not that last one.
at least not in Shadyside. This small suburban town has a long history of tragedies, while the wealthier neighboring Sunnyvale has seen nothing but success and handsome police chiefs. That's whack! Fear Street Part 1, 1994 kicks off a horror trilogy that explores the bloody past of Shadyside. All these massacres are connected to Sarah Fear. Was the town once cursed by a witch, or is it something more sinister? I, I mean, no one actually thinks that this witch shit is real. Though Fear Street is based on a series of R.L. Stein books, this is not your sibling's Goosebumps movie. I love this one. They're swearing. Fuck this. Fuck Peter. Fuck Sam. Yeah, fuck her. Sex. Did you all go to Pound Town? And a whole lot of blood. If you get blood on it, I'll kill you. Because this movie isn't just referencing slashers, it is one. You are all fucking this weekend, watch Fear Street Part 1, 1994, as we explore the series in tandem with Friday the 13th this August. And this Sunday, only two days away, tune into Dead Meat for the kill count. This internet bullshit is potentially exactly why you have no friends. Fear Street Part 1, 1994 can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's kill count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this kill recount on Friday the 13th. I want to thank some patrons like Ripley Wielden, William, Andrew Koss, Cameron Craft and more, Puppy, Dominic Abraham, Jason Garnett, and the Concierge. I also want to thank Crystal Lake Memories, both the book and the 2013 documentary, which are great sources of behind the scenes information. And yeah, your eyes didn't deceive you with that trailer. In two days, we start Fear Street, which will run on Sundays this month. You're welcome. Thanks everyone, be good people.